clarify one point we mentioned last week, which lacked clarity. We spoke about Rabbi Nachman mentioned this idea of the Kafchet Atvan de Uvda de Bereshit to translate the 28 letters of the act of creation. What in the world is that referring to? So it's understood, it's explained. This is referring to the 28 letters found in the first verse of the Torah. The first verse, Bereshit, Bara, Elohim, Et, Hashemayim, Et, Haaretz. You count the letters, it totals 28. So you might ask, okay, so what? Whoopee, you know, what there's the whole act of creation involves what's called the 10 utterances. And the Lord said, let there be, and the Lord said, let there be, and the Lord said, let there be. There's nine of those. Plus the very first verse, Bereshit, which is called the hidden utterance. The whole act of creation goes on until the seventh day, the whole beginning of creation. Why does the first verse stick out that it's called the 28 letters of the act of creation? Why we call that first verse the act of creation? Because, he explains elsewhere, Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Nosin, based on the lesson called Ayeh in part 2 of the Kutei Moran, lesson number 12, if I recall correctly, that he says there that this Ma'amar Satum, this hidden utterance, which is found in the very first verse of the Torah, basically contains the entire Torah and contains within it the whole act of creation. If you noticed, the holy Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who wrote the Zohar, also wrote a second book, a higher book, called the Tikkunei Zohar, the Rectifications of the Zohar, which is on a much, much loftier and higher level than the actual Zohar itself. And the whole book is 70 explanations based on the very first word of the Torah, Bereshit, which is part of the very first verse of the Torah, showing, and he did that specifically, even though Rabbi Nachman writes in his book, Chaim Ora and Tzaddik, that if we would want to, we can go on to in every single next word of the Torah, right, Bara, Et, Hashamah, and you can write another book of 70 chapters, <laughs> Rabbi Shimon, if he wanted to, he could have wrote books on every word of the Torah, involving 70 chapters explaining that one word. But you see, on a practical level, he actually did on the first word of the Torah, Bereshit, to show that this is of absolute importance. This is where it really starts. Okay? So with that, we understand that the whole act of creation is hidden in the very first verse of the Torah. And when a simple Jew, a simple person, claps his hands during the davening, what that does is it reactivates. When you think about it, it's unbelievable. It reactivates the act of creation, that's what it's actually doing, it's phenomenal. You are now creating, reconnecting the creation, for what purpose? I want to daven, I want to daven to Hashem. My daven now has a few things in it, it's praising Hashem, connecting to God, asking Him for requests, I want to come back to Him, I want this. To, I want help in this area, in that area, etc. I want breakthroughs to happen in my life. So now I go to a higher source, the highest source, source possible, which is the act of creation, Hashem's beginning point of this world, reconnecting to that source, that highest level in the finite existence of this world, the beginning point which is found in the opening verse of the Torah, by reconnecting with my 28 parts of my fingers, 14 here, 14 here, 28, joining them together, I'm reconnecting my fingers, which are a symbolic of Hashem's, so to speak, 28 fingers, because we have what's called anthropomorphisms, that Hashem also created the world, the world with His hands, right? Like verses say, like the, Hashem, the, the verse that Rabbi Nachman brought, right? The koach ma'asav higid la'amo, the strength of His ma'asim, His actions. Actions are with the hands. And it's koach specifically, strength, which has the, the gematra, the America value of 28, hinting to Hashem's hands. And by the way, Rav Nassin, on the prayer on this le lesson, he brings another verse where it says, clearly Hashem created the world with the hands. Af yimini tipecha shamayim. Hashem says, even my right hand, tipecha, tafach, spread out, opened up the heavens. So you see hands, so to speak, anthropomorphisms, as if we're saying Hashem has actual hands. His hands, in our context of our understanding that was a whole by the way there was a whole thing in last week in the parsha nitro in rashi how it's it talks about hashem listening hashem's voice 
This Rav Rashi goes in detail to say these are what's called anthropomorphism. How could we say Hashem has a voice and ears? But it's to give the creation, the creatures, a means to relate to the Creator. That's the only way a finite existence, pers existing person, can understand and relate to God if Hashem uses terms that we can relate to. We can relate to ears and eyes and speech. So we have we attribute that also as if, so to speak, to God. Okay. So in a sense, Hashem has twenty-eight parts of His hands, so to speak, and they're corresponded into our twenty-eight parts of our hands, so that when we join them together, making them a unison while davening, while saying words, expressions of yearning, of prayer, of supplication, of wanting to turn to Hashem to help. So now by joining the 28 together, 14 and 14, making the 28, this is actually reawakening the act of creation so that we can pray at the maximum level possible to get the maximum mileage in our davening. You'll see it throughout Rabbi Nachman's teachings. He gives so many pieces of advice how to maximize your davening. One, for example, is attaching any prayer you say to the tzaddikim, the true tzaddikim, who can then take your prayers and elevate them to the right place. Another advice Rabbi Nachman gives is to try to focus on the simple meaning of the words because your mind is going off crazy of all types of confusions, attacking specifically while you're davening. And by focusing on the simple meaning of the words, that's how you can connect to the words of the davening. But the advice given here is really an amazing advice of clapping the hands, which also requires some effort. Some people, they come to davening so down, so dead, so out of it, right? Still, the heavy, in the heaviness, if you just clap your hands, which is a physical activity, sometimes you can't talk, you can't open your mouth, you're overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed to even concentrate on the simple meaning of the words. Even that you forget. So clapping the hands is an amazing reminder. I recall a story I heard over many times from Rav Meir Karlebach. Meir Karlebach is a present-day Breslover here in Jerusalem. And he remembers hearing from a Breslov elder of the previous generation, Rav Eliel Chaim Rosen. Rav Eliel Chaim Rosen used to say, that when I hear somebody else in the davening clapping their hands, and most people, they might say, it bothers them. This guy's clapping his hands in the middle of the davening. It moves my concentration. So Rabbi Chaim Rosen used to say, just the opposite. When he's clapping the hands, he's reminding me that I'm davening because I, I get, I'm forgetting so much that I'm davening. So at least his hand clapping, the other guy clapping the hands, and so to speak, disturbing me, are really being a wake-up reminder that I have to daven properly. And this is an amazing advice of clapping the hands. Like I said, in most Breslov uh, congregations, especially during the Shabbat davening, especially, especially in the Friday night prayers, you will see and experience a lot of hand clapping throughout the Kabbalat Shabbat service and the Friday night Arvit evening service. Something amazing. It must be tasted to experience, to see a Breslov, a normal Breslov minion on Friday night. Um, uh, just before we go on, I see some questions already. Okay. When the pain is, this is a question from Hadar. When the pain is so bad, how do you pray with positive outcome when negative thoughts are in the mind? So that's exactly what we spoke about. Clapping the hands is meant to clear the head. That's the advice here. The clapping of the hands, we're going to go into it, activating the 28 letters of Bereshit will also clear a person from the mabul, the, the, the flooding. We're going to go into this in more detail, God willing, in Lessons 45 and 46, where he addresses directly the idea of the bilbulim, the confusing negative thoughts as they're attacking. But in our context already, from what we spoke about already last week, we can say already, but clapping the hands is, is meant to help you to get positive thoughts in the davening. That's the goal. I want to have positive thinking while davening. I need that platform in order to properly say the words. The goal of davening is the words. Don't forget. The goal is not just clapping. The clapping is a means to elevate and help the words come out better. That's how you to give the platform, to give the surrounding. Just like we said, if you remember last week, 
that when you say words, any words, so you're using the air around you, which you inhale, and then when you're speaking, speech is exhaling, is letting out the, the, the words, the air is coming out in word format with the combination of the vocal cords, right? So you're using the air to speak. So now we're going to see, we're, we'll, we'll explain better now, that the quality of the air intake before davening, during davening, right, has a major effect and influence on the quality of the words. So now when clapping the hands, and we said the motion of clapping pushes out air, like you see when you put your face in front of your hands while clapping, you feel a breeze, right? Because that the pressure of the hands clapping changes the quality of the air around you. And that it's turning it into the quality of the land of Israel. We went into that last week, that the 28 strength of Hashem hinted to in the very first verse of the Torah is in order to give the Jewish people the ability to conquer anywhere in the world, transform those four cubits where they are into the level, the quality of the Holy Land. What's the difference? So what? So that I'm technically standing and breathing air of the quality of the Holy Land. So what? When this quality air comes into me, and then I say words of prayer, I'm exhaling words using that air oxygen from the Holy Land, it's a different prayer. It's the quality of the oxygen going in, of the whole Avira, the Eretz Yisrael Machim, the Gemara says, if you remember, we said that last week, the, 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 just the air, air quality of the Holy Land makes a person wise. In our context, you're breathing it in while davening, so the quality of the davening is like you're davening at the Kotel, at the, 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 at the Western Wall, and here in the Holy Land, in Eretz Yisrael, and the quality of the davening is different, obviously. It's changed now. So this is meant to help you clean the thoughts of, of all types of negative thoughts, because the whole idea of Eretz Yisrael is positive thinking, it's joy, it's feeling good about yourself, feeling positive and, and thankful to Hashem about and valuing the good that He's given to you, valuing yourself, valuing your ability to daven, valuing your prayers, all that is benefited by clapping the hands. Uh, are there specific places in davening where clapping is called for? This is the second question from Yosef Meyer. Or is it more of a spontaneous act? I would 100% see that it's clearly a spontaneous act. It's, it's, it's up to you. Any part of the davening and your clapping changes that area. If you feel you need to clap, and you clap in order to get out of the bad thinking process, right? The bad mode, the negative mode, you need to do wherever it is. It's spontaneous in that sense. There's no specific places. Like you can't now be very constricted and say, oh, I'm clapping my hands here because I used to see Breslav or Hasidim also clapping their hands here. Even though there are people and there were people who were like that, still you are unique. You are special. You have a unique connection to God that you have to develop. And it's basically up to you, bottom line, where you clap in the davening. Is my hand drumming on djembe, dumbik, timbrels, same and similar effect to hand clapping? Well, first of all, hand clapping in davening, uh, I understand the typos, I got that, okay? That um, the, the hand clapping on Shabbat, you're not allowed to start drumming on, on timbrels and stuff like that. You're not allowed to, to, to play a musical instrument. That's all prohibition. Hand clapping is is the idea of any time, even on Shabbat. Even though in Halacha, by the way, it's a whole thing of if you're allowed to clap your hands on Shabbat. So like there are restrictions. You're not allowed to clap your hands at the Shabbos table because we're worried you might start taking now knives and forks and start banging them against the cups and start playing musical instruments. That's a problem on Shabbat, right? But if it's during the davening, there's no prohibition at all if now as part of the concentration for the davening, you're clapping your hands to express your joy also to clap your hands. So now going back, since you have in your hands the joints, 28 joints, and you don't have that on drums and timbrels, etc. So obviously you don't have the same effect. It's specifically using your two hands, clapping your hands. And unfortunately, somebody only has one hand. <laughs> it hurts to say this, it's funny, but someone technically has only one hand. So he can take if he has his left hand. So to clap it with another person's uh, right hand. <laughs> and that way, also we can activate the 28th visit. All right. With all this introduction, we just see if there's any comments on the Facebook page. If there's any questions? Uh, very good. Okay, nothing yet, I see. 
Fine. So let us now continue, Bezat Hashem. We're now going to open the bridge, Likud Temoran, like I said. Lesson 44. Paragraph number 2, where we left off. So he says like this. Now it adds, Rabbi Nachman, another point. We spoke about clapping the hands to transform where you are to the Holy Land. Now if you know Halacha and the Code of Jewish Law, there is a preference in mitzvah to fix a place where you daven. You shouldn't daven one day in this shul, one day in that shul, jumping around. You should, number one, try to fix a shul that you daven constantly. Because every time you daven in a different place, so you have to adjust your concentration to the new environment every day. If someone, for example, is very used to davening every morning at the Western Wall, even though the Western Wall, there's always thousands of new people coming, but this person is adjusted to davening there, so he got used to it, fine. But more than that, the halacha goes on, even in a, in a shul itself that you daven in, that you should fix your davening in one shul, even there you should fix a place in the shul. You shouldn't daven one day in the northeast corner, and then the next day in the northwest corner, and the next day in the southwest, southwest corner, and the southeast corner, and the middle of the shul. You should daven approximately within four cubits of where you normally daven. That's why that's also kovea makom betfidato. So watch what he says now, Rabbi Nachman. Paragraph number two, lesson 44, Abridge Likute Moran. Balken, Tzarich Ligoa Makom Litfilato. Therefore, it's a, it's a, a person should fix a place for their daven, like we said right now, like we explained. Kafilu Keshe Omed Litpalel Bemakom Shitpalel Tzadik. Look what he says here, amazing. Even if now you want to daven in the same place that a tzaddik used to daven. They have this, for example, in uh, in Tveria. There's a very old, old shul. I, it's, I think it's called the shul of Rav Chaim Abu Lafia. That it, it was existing even before this Rav Chaim Abu Lafia came to Tveria. And there's a, a place there, which is like a, a type of a stone uh, bench, a little uh, a mood, a pillar, an, a pillar of stone. That the, the tradition is that the Arizal when he used to come to visit Tveria, he would sit down and daven in that spot. You also have, for example, in the city of Medjibush in Ukraine, the place where the Baal Shem Tov, approximately where he used to daven. And all, also in, in Chabad, in New York, the place where the Lubavitch Rebbe used to stand where he daven, and the Tosh Rebbe in Montreal. You have all types of examples of tzaddikim that they stood while they're davening. So he's saying, you might think, oh, I'd like to daven in the same spot where he davened. Look what he says here. Even if I stand to daven in a place where I want daven, what is it? What's the nafkamina? What what comes out of this? You might think, oh, if now a tzaddik wants daven in this spot, that means the reshimo, the impression that this tzaddik left in this spot, even after his passing must still be there. And therefore, if I, little me, davened in that same spot where this tzaddik also davened, I'll be able to get a free trip, a free ride, a boost in my personal davening. So watch what Rabbi Nachman says, because even if you choose to stand and daven, pray, in a place where tzaddik also once prayed, Look what he says. Nevertheless, you find the exact opposite results. He is very hard for him. It is very hard for him to daven there. You might, you might ask now, why not? Why? Why is that the case? And now, it's been sanctified that this spot into the category of the holiness of the Holy Land. In other words, the impression of the tzaddik standing on that spot, in that area, and davening, should influence that he transformed the atmosphere there even after his passing to the level of the Holy Land, meaning I should feel that in my davening, I should feel that intensity and that closeness reflected in my davening. He says, nevertheless, no, it's very difficult for him to stand there and daven. Why? Because he's not yet uh, associated with the air of that spot. And the and all the more so if you stand to daven in a spot 
where a wicked person, not a tzaddik, but a wicked person prayed, and you and you dove and you try to stand there also, you will be negatively influenced, but also you won't be able to connect. What's going on here? What's he saying? It's like this. Is that you think you might think that if I have the merit to pray where Tzadik once stood in his davening, this will automatically affect me for the positive, and I should feel and see the results. Rabbi Nachman saying no. You have to personally already act to elevate the air of the Holy Land, you personally, in order to feel the influence, which will be, of course, multiplied much more, of, 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 of a tzaddik who also davened in this spot. To explain better, it is not something light to daven in a place of a tzaddik. It's something which is, yes, is worthy, that if you have the merit of standing in a place where a tzaddik once davened, that is something very big. But now to feel it, it's not enough. You will also personally on your own activity have to activate the holiness of the Holy Land in our context by clapping your hands. By you clapping your hands in order to activate the holiness of the Holy Land, this will enable you to feel if it works out in your lifetime that you have the chance of standing in a place where Tzaddik once stood and davening there also to feel the energy, to feel that light, you have to activate it on your personal level first. You need to open the door with a key. You need to get to the key to open the door. You're 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 on the right address, but to get in, to be there, really be there, to open the door to feel it, you have to on your own experience it also. So he and he says that also that this is all the more so when you dive into a place where a wicked person is, is that it's compounded now. If now you don't activate the holiness of the land of Israel. So that's not enough. Plus, you're standing in a place where a wicked person used to dive in, and it could bring you down even more so. So that's even without clapping the hands. Sorry, that's with clapping the hands also, it can bring you down, all the more so you don't clap your hands. What he's saying here is an amazing insight, that yes, sometimes, if you feel you're standing in a certain place, and you can't concentrate as much as you're trying, maybe consider moving to another place. I, 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 um, being, fixing a new place for your davening somewhere else in the shul. If you know that someone not so good is to daven here, and you see that you're trying so much for kavana, it could be well that the place has, has the negative influence of this wicked person. It's an amazing insight that wherever you are in the world, you can be influenced by someone who was once standing there and expressed his negative desires, but all the more so holy desires and good desires. Just like the idea that a shul, once you have a synagogue anywhere in the world, even after it was destroyed, the place itself has already absorbed, has already sucked into itself the holiness of that shul. Even if afterwards they build a marketplace over it, or they build a giant building, there's no more synagogue there, the holiness of the shul, once people dove in there and connected to the holiness of Eretz Yisrael by davening in those places, the holiness is never lost. It's a, it's a midrash even that the holiness of the shuls in the diaspora, the holiness activated by the synagogues and study, Torah study halls, it will, remains there. Even if afterwards it becomes a regular storefront or a marketplace or a residential building, whatever, it maintains holiness in that spot no matter what. But here he's saying that fixing yourself to davening is very important because you will then accustom yourself to transforming that spot to the holiness of the Holy Land. So that means, for example, if yesterday I daven with such energy, okay, and I clap my hands in the davening, and I, I feel like I got somewhere. Then the next day, I come to the same spot to daven, and now today also I'm clapping my hands to, to connect to the holiness of the Holy Land in my davening. So it, it attaches itself to yesterday's repercussion. In other words, reper yesterday's positive influence of activating the Holy Land of Esther yesterday stays in the air on that spot where you were yesterday. It's that it stays there for today also, and it accumulates. This is the idea of fixing a place to daven, because the hand clapping that you've done, plus the words that were generated from such a high level of davening, stay in that spot, so that when you fix, you're affixed to an and you are, what's, what's, what's the good word in English? You're connected to so much to the holiness of that spot that you've 
developed so it becomes a part of you and it becomes a part of your davening. And this is the explanation. Rabbi Nachman is trying to explain the halachic requirement to daven in the same space, to fix a place in a shul, in this one shul, and also to try to daven in one shul, not to jump around every day, to try to have a place where you're fixed for davening. It happens once in a blue moon, once in a while, a person goes elsewhere to daven. If it's your traveling purposes or to experience a different type of davening, but in the main, a person should fix a place where they do daven. And even in the shul, like we're saying, to have a fixed spot in the synagogue that, that you should daven. Why? Because like we said, that your it, your efforts in davening and hand clapping, etc., influence that spot so that it, it's just a cumulative visit to Hashem. And we can assume that your davening 20 years later in the same spot will be, God willing, much more enhanced. And not the opposite. Ah, I used to daven so amazing and now I'm like a dead person. That's happening. So we're teaching the idea of this class is to reawaken. Start. Did you clap your hands then? Maybe not. You were just getting a free gift of davening with such a high that wasn't earned. You didn't earn it. It was given to you as a gift. Now they want you to earn everything. So now use the advice of clapping your hands in the davening in order to connect to the atmosphere of the Holy Land. Once that is done, all the good davening you've done in your past in the same spot five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever it is, it accumulates and adds, a, 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 what's the word? It, it joins, attaches itself to your davening right now. Amazing. Okay. I see someone said a comment here. Esther, at my Chabad, I wasn't supposed to clap except if singing. I thought I heard, so we would clap. We would sign clap. That's cute. <laughs> All right. Paragraph number three. Just want to see if there's any questions or comments on the other page. One second, please. Bear with me. Very good. All right. To continue. Okay. Paragraph number three. And this is the meaning of the verse. Get ready. He's going to offer amazing insights on this verse, a few of them. That the prayers, this, the morning prayer, the afternoon prayer, and the evening prayer, they were established, okay, specifically the morning prayer and the afternoon prayer, which are obligatory from the Torah, and the night prayer was added on as being an obligation by the later sages. They were instituted, the morning prayer was instituted by Abraham, the afternoon prayer was instituted by Yitzhak, Isaac, and the evening prayer was instituted by Arvid. The sages made the morning prayer and afternoon prayer obligatory, that every Jew twice a day has to pray to Hashem in the morning and the afternoon. Why? Why was that obligatory? Afterwards, they came and said, the evening prayer also is obligatory. So when we say prayer, we don't mean about the, 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 the recital, the Kriyat Shema. Kriyat Shema is a different devotion, which happens to be within the prayer service. But you have to say Kriyat Shema every morning and every evening, that's for sure. Just the rabbis instituted that it should be part of the davening service of the evening service and the morning service. Fine. So now, the rabbis say in the Gemara and the Talmud, Tfilot, Keneged Tmidin Tiknun, that the prayers were established to correspond to the daily sacrifices. We said Avraham established the morning prayer, Yitzchak established the afternoon prayer. Also in the temple, there was a morning sacrifice every morning. It was called the Korban Tamid. Tamid translates as always, consistent, every day. This sacrifice was offered every single morning, even on Shabbat. Even on Yom Kippur, it was offered every single day. Nothing, nothing, nothing pushed off this morning of a sacrifice. Every holiday, every festival had this sacrifice offered in the morning. And also, the second one was in the afternoon. At the afternoon time, also, there was an obligatory kor korban sacrifice every single day. Every single day. Fine. So, the Gemara teaches that the prayer services of the morning and the afternoon prayer correspond to, were established 
to parallel the two sacrifices because we don't have a temple today so instead of the temple we daven we daven the morning prayer service to protect us just like the sacrifice the daily sacrifice would protect the jewish people and also the afternoon prayer I was also to correspond to the, the afternoon sacrifice, which you don't have today because the, the temple has been destroyed. So we have to make up for it in a way, in a sense, to a certain degree, the afternoon prayer. So the wording of the, of the Gemara is in Brachot, page 26, that the prayers were made to correspond. The word in Hebrew, keneged, which literally translates as facing, opposing, opposition, but it means to face, face to face. It faces, it represents the daily sacrifice, tiknum, the rabbis, the sages of the Talmud, of the Mishnah, established these two prayer services to correspond to the two sacrifices. So again, Avram Yitzchak may have instituted it, but being established, to be established as an obligatory devotion, they used the sacrifice to determine that. The daily sacrifice in the Holy Temple would determine the obligation of davening every morning and every afternoon especially now that there's no holy temple standing and there's no sacrifices so he explains the wording of the of the gemara like this rabbi nachman Hainu, in other words what is this phrase really trying to say what is the deeper meaning behind it the moral lesson behind it the hidden advice hidden in the statement Hainu, <laughs> the, the the statement of the sages is teaching us that you should see to it, that you should see to it, that your davening should always be a prayer in the oxygen, in the air of the Holy Land. How do you see that? How in the world do you see in these four words, tfilot, keneged, temidin, tiknum, prayers were made to correspond to the daily sacrifice. That's, when they were, that's how they were established. Those are the four words here. So how do you see that? The Hainu, in other words, how do you see this? Tikun machshavot zarot shebat Wow. The rectification, tikun. That's the last word of the, of the, of the statement from the Gemara. Tfilot keneget midin tiknum. The tikun, the rectification. The word tikun means to establish, an establishment. But also means, right, to rectify, to fix. Tikun machshavot zarot. To fix, here we go, what we're talking about, foreign thoughts. To fix, rectify all types of foreign thoughts, distracting foreign thoughts, shibitfila, that come to bother me while davening, that are hinted to in the words of the statement of the sages in the Gemara, shehem bechinat tfilot keneged. Amazing, amazing. Rabbi Nachman is literally one in a generation to dress up so perfectly and so nicely his 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 concept into the words of the sages. It fits in so amazingly. The wording is Tfilot Keneged, which literally translates as the prayers were established to represent, to face, but we said the word Keneged also means against. So Tfilot Keneged can be translated as when I'm having opposition to my davening. Tfilot Keneged, because in the Gemara it reads, Tfilot keneged t'midin. Prayers were made to face, to represent t'midin, the daily sacrifice. Rabbi Nachman reads it differently. He puts the comma in a, in a different place. He puts the comma after, after the words keneged. Tfilot keneged, comma, when you have opposition to your davening, you have against davening, meaning your davening is packed, packed with foreign thoughts, distracting thoughts, they don't let you daven. You see that it's a supernal, a, a spiritual force preventing you, an, a, an evil spiritual force preventing you from davening. You're doing your best. You were able to concentrate five minutes ago. As soon as you open your mouth to daven, boom, your head is not there all of a sudden. What's going on? Why can't my head be there during davening? What is going on? So it's tfilot keneged. I'm being attacked. My prayer has opposition. They're not letting me concentrate on the simple words of the prayers. So what do I have to do if I'm being faced with this malady, this spiritual malady of the soul that I'm, I have distracting thoughts in my davening? Okay. So now, tiknum. He's reading the last word of the, of the statement of the sages. Tiknum. 
In other words, how do you fix it? Tikunam alidei bechinat Eretz Yisrael, through the Holy Land, activating the Holy Land. And what is it said about the Holy Land? If you know your Torah Bible very well, Deuteronomy, Dvarim, chapter 11, verse 13, it says, and the praising, that Moshe is praising the Holy Land, it says there in that verse, it says about the Holy Land, it says about the Holy Land, Tamid ene the Holy Land sticks out from any other land on the earth right now, and that Hashem's divine providence, His eye, the eyes of Hashem, are constantly on the Holy Land. Tamid ene Hashem Always are the eyes of Hashem, your Lord, on it. In other words, the land of Israel is 100% governed by divine providence and not governed by the laws of nature. In other words, rainfall here, for example, is to do directly, directly by the actions of the people living in the Holy Land. If they are deserving, there'll be rain. If there's, they're not deserving, there won't be rain. That is as opposed to anywhere else in the world, Russia, Ukraine, China, America, United States, Canada, anywhere in the world, that it's part of nature, that it's normal, that there is rainfall in the winter, and there's summer and spring, and all the all the all of the you know the characteristics of the seasons de- determined by nature are fixed. Sometimes you have snowstorms, strain storms, but all that are all those are giving are given scientific explanations and rationale. The Holy Land, even as much as scientists and weather forecasts will try to give logical, rational, scientific explanations, ultimately, ultimately, and clearly has a direct relationship to the people of the land, the Jewish people, the land of Israel, residing in the land of Israel. They determine the quality of the blessings. That's what it's saying here, that Hashem's eyes are always on the land. In other words, the eyes of divine providence, that He looks how deserving are the people, and that's how He gives it to them based on their actions. But on a deeper level, that the Holy Land is always a source of blessing. Even if there seems to be poverty and lack in the Holy Land, but the people who experience it take it in such a positive frame because they see how it's part of their spiritual development and growth to come closer to Hashem. So everything is seen as positive and coming directly from the love of Hashem. So this verse can also be meant to say that Hashem's eyes are always on the land of Israel to see what it needs, what it needs and what the people living it on a need in order to flourish, in order to grow. Even if it seems to be opposite than what's positive, even if it seems to be poverty, sickness, whatever, but the, the eyes are, of Hashem are in this scenario, in this blessing, in this whatever's coming down to the Holy Land. And it's clear, it's pretty clear that it's coming from pure divine providence without scientific rationale. That is the advantage of living in the Holy Land. So now, the verse started off, this verse from Dvarim, the fifth book of the Bible, started with the word Tamid. Right? The verse is saying, Tamid always are Hashem's eyes on the Holy Land. As if to say, this uniqueness of always is unique specifically to the Holy Land. So now Rabbi Nachman does a hekesh, a comparison. The word tamid always is used in, re- in regard to the Holy Land, but it's also used in regard to the daily sacrifice, which is called korban tamid. So Binachman has the liberty to open up the, ver- the statement of the sages in the Gemara and to translate tamidin, not specifically and constricted and restricted only to the daily sacrifices, but tamidin can be read as the tamid, the, 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 the holiness of the Holy Land. So with all that said, this is how Rabbi Nachman reads the phrase from the Talmud, from the Masachet Brachot, that tfilot keneged, kama, when you see you have opposition to davening, you can't daven with a clear head, you have all types of distracting and foreign thoughts just killing you, bothering you, making your davening miserable and just attempt something you just want to get over with already, because I'm obligated to daven, I have no choice. Right? That's the attitude when you have when you're not into the davening. You just want to get over with it already. 
just want to do your obligation and just finish with it. So when you have tefilot keneged, you have opposition to your davening. Tmidin tiknum, the rectification for such davening, to rectify it and fix it, that it should be proper davening, is tmidin, through the Holy Land, which is called tamid, always, because Hashem's eyes are always upon the Holy Land. This is phenomenal. This is an example of Rabbi Nachman's far-reaching perceptions and how he dresses it so amazingly, so perfectly, so nicely in a regular statement of the sages in the Gemara. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Okay? Um, so let's just finish this paragraph here. Okay? Uh, fine, we finished that. That's that's paragraph number three. I think we explained it quite clearly. Just we have some more comments here. Um, forgive me, I missed a spot. Can you share once more how clapping light ties you to Israel? That's a whole class. I suggest you just to listen, uh, Miss Esther M., to the first class in this series where we explained it much more in detail. And also the whole opening of this class, you can hear it in the, in the what's it called, the recording of this class, God willing. Um, another question. Would you say, if I may ask boldly, do you think the spiritual forces against us during davening to distract or encourage not to do is from the Satan? Yes, it's, all, it's from the evil side. And Rabbi Nachman goes into it, it's from your evil deeds that you've done yourself. All the, the blemishes that you've done, they make themselves heard. This he says, Rabbi Nachman, in lesson number 30. They make themselves heard while davening. They come to you to distract you because that's where they seek to be rectified. And he has another few lessons where he talks about it. If you take a look in the Kutimur in lesson 26 and 27, lesson number 30, where also he talks about distracting thoughts during davening, they come to seek rectification. These bad thoughts are holy sparks trapped due to your specific uh, misdeeds, which have caused these holy sparks to be trapped on the other side, and they seek rectification, which is specifically at the time of davening, that's why they come to attack, they come to bother you. So they're not necessarily part of the satan, they're sent from the evil side, that's the job to do, to do misery, to do, to do pain, to do suffering, but really, they're holy sparks seeking rectification, and your job is to help elevate them by focusing on the davening, concentrating on the davening, that's how you successfully elevate them. Uh, another comment by by Mr. Bill Hill, just read part of book of Rav Kronimus Shapira, that he encourages visualization to make davening intense. Does this fit with rest of thought? Why not? That's also a uh, a statement from Rav Chaim Volodin, the author of the Nefesh Shachaim, where he says an amazing advice to concentrate on davening is to envision in your head the picture of the letters. When you say the word Baruch, to picture Bet, Resh, Chaf, Vav, Chaf, right? Ata, Aleph, Tav, Hey, to visualize, to visualize it. But like the Ben Yishchai, when he brings this down, he says, if you daven at that rate, <laughs> you won't be able to daven with any minion, right? You'll be going super duper slow. For sure, you'll be davening with Kavana, but you realize that you'll have to invest at least like an hour for Mincha if you do that. So it is an advice. Anything to help you in davening is for sure appreciated and accepted, and a person should seek it. Here we're giving just Rabbi Nachman's advice of hand clapping that it's so very far-reaching to help you in your davening. Okay, next paragraph is a bit long. Let's see how far we can get in this paragraph number four. We're going to have to stop in the middle and continue next week. Let's see how far we get in this paragraph. Perush. Second, please. Let's see what's happening here. Vezeh Perush. And this is the meaning of the following verse. Uvyad Hanevi'im Adame. This verse is from the book Hosea, chapter 12, verse 11. It says there that, uh, that the prophet is speaking on behalf of Hashem. Uvyad Hanevi'im Adame. Hashem is saying, and in the hands of the prophets, Adame. Wow. I think before we go into this, I will have to give a bit of an introduction to explain what's so different between davening in the Holy Land and davening in Chutzlarts. We went into these points briefly in paragraph number one, but I see that as a preparation this paragraph, we'll have to mention this one point, okay? The Gemara says, the Gemara says like this, it's a whole discussion. The Gemara says, 
that the land of, of Israel is pure, tahor, and the land of the diaspora is impure. What does that mean, that the land of Israel is pure and the land of the diaspora is impure? It's in regards to bones buried in the land. We assume that anywhere you go in the diaspora, anywhere outside of Israel, okay, there are bodies, bones of bodies of people from previous civilizations from 100, 200, 500,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, that are buried deep in the earth. So now, if now, uh, mix, so, so what, 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 is the, what do the rabbis say? That even though earth has been plowed and dug and everything and this construction taking place, we have a worry that in every section of earth from anywhere in the diaspora, there may be an admixture of the bones, of the body parts, bones specifically, remnants of bodies, even of Gentiles. So you might say, what do I care? What do we do? So in the time of the Holy Temple, in the time that the Temple stood, there was this mitzvah of eating what's called truma. Truma is specifically food, holy tithed food, reserved specifically to be eaten, eaten by Kohanim, by the priests who served in the Holy Temple. And it required a high level of purity in order to eat it. The Kohen had to be pure to eat it. And also the, the truma, the food item, if it was tithed, for example, truma taken from the crops, from the grapes, from the oil, olive oil, from all the produce, okay? So the people had to maintain it by the time they went, from the time they brought it to the Kohen, sorry, from the time they, they removed it until the time that they brought it to the priest, they had to make sure and ensure that it was kept in purity. Because if now the truma becomes impure, and it's impurity that cannot be departed, so it has to be burnt. It's lost now. And that you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to bring holy food, holy truma, tithed food, to become impure. You're supposed to maintain its purity so that it can be eaten by the Kohanim. So in truma, both the food item has to maintain a level of purity. You have to make sure it's pure. And also the Kohanim themselves have to be pure. So now the Torah lists what can contaminate the spiritual purity of the truma. If it comes in contact with a corpse. Now it doesn't have to be only a, a corpse of a Jewish body, but even the corpse of a Gentile, if the truma comes into contact with a body, remnants of a corpse of a Gentile, that truma has to be burnt. It becomes impure now. Okay? So this applies everything in the Holy Land, because another detail is, you're not allowed to take truma and eat it outside of the boundaries of the Holy Land. So, so then if that's the case, where would you have a case of earth from the diaspora coming in contact with Truma? If somebody dug up earth from outside of the Holy Land and brought it into the Holy Land, and the Truma accidentally touched, came in contact with this earth, so it's rendered unfit because there's an assumption that the earth has in it, in its compound and its, its construct, particles left from the bodies, the impure body particles of the corpses of a Gentile, even a Gentile. Fine. So that's the law. Uh, in, in brief, it's a whole, there's much more details. I can't go, in the context of this class, I can't go into all the details, okay? But now the Gemara also discusses, how about the air, the air of the, of the diaspora? Could it be that the air of the diaspora is also impure? So they asked the sages, <laughs> what is the imaginable case? You're not, I'm not allowed to take truma to eat it outside of Israel. So where do you have a case of truma coming in contact with the air of the diaspora? So they give a scenario that you put the truma in a box, okay? So it has like a type of a mechitza. So it's a box, like... It's in a different domain by putting a box, but the bottom of the box is left open so that it's traveling, the box is going through the diaspora, fine, but the but it's in the, technically not because it's contained in a box, 
However, it has no bottom. So therefore, the air under underneath has contact technically with the truma. You ask yourself, what, what do I care about this? So we know it like this. By a Jewish corpse, okay, a Kohen, for example, is not allowed to walk over a, a Jewish cemetery. Why is the Kohen forbidden to walk in a cemetery? And by extension, truma, if there was truma today, you're not allowed to bring it into a cemetery, even if it doesn't touch any grave, doesn't touch any tombstone, doesn't touch any earth connected to a body. The problem is that a Jewish corpse, that once it's a corpse, there's an impurity on the physical body, that's for sure we know, even by gentle, a Gentile, but also the impurity goes upwards. You have a body buried, even in the Holy Land. So now any airspace above the body and below the body renders anything going in that airspace. It's not even touching the corpse. It just passes through, even by plane, technically passes over that spot where there's a corpse, it becomes impure. So now, in the Gemara, there's a discussion, does this apply also to the bodies of Gentiles? If now, Truma technically was put in a box and now goes over the land of the diaspora, the land is impure. The Truma is not touching the land, it's not touching the earth. So it did not become impure, but it's touching the air, it's in contact with the air, which is over the corpse, is that considered impure? So the rabbis say, yes. They concluded later, initially it wasn't instituted. Afterwards it was, yes, instituted. That the avir, the chutz la'aretz tameh, the avir, the air wave, the air space of chutz la'aretz, even above the body of a corpse, is rendered impure. And thus, if truma was transported in this box, which didn't have a bottom to it, it's like being held like, like, a, like a net or something, by a string, but there's no bottom to the box, so the truma is it's covered, it's protected, but it has no undering. So if it was in that scenario, the truma would, yes, become in contact with the air over the corpse of a Gentile in the diaspora and also become tame. The one who disagrees with this is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the Mishnah, in the section tractate called Olot, he rules that the land, the, the air in the diaspora is not Tamil. But the halacha follows like the majority that yes, the air in the diaspora is Tamil. In our context, look at this. On a, on a, on a, like on a, on a, on a, how do I explain, on a moralistic explanation level. Davening in Chutz Laretz means that the distractions bothering you are coming from the impurity of the bones. What does it mean, the idea of there being in the earth of the diaspora? We assume anywhere in the world, like North America, South America, Africa, Asia, that there is bone compartments, bones from, from bod corpses of Gentiles. Normally, Gentiles are not the ones who believe in the one God. The Gentiles are the one, normally, the majority of them, follow idol worship. So the idol worship they did rests on their body even after they pass away. So that negative influence of idol worship is associated with their bones, that, that making the purity in the earth. When a Jew comes to Davin and he has under his feet the impurity of the bones of, of the diaspora, so and, and the, the symbol of the bones is idol worship, and the symbol of idol worship is not concentration on God, because davening is called emuna. Davening to Hashem, concentrated davening is called emuna. So that automatically means the opposite is true. The opposite of concentrated davening, the opposite of faith is idol worship. So when you're standing in the diaspora, the influence, the negative influence of the earth affects your davening. So now the question is on the air. You're standing, your head, your head and your, your words of prayer are not tangible. Your words of prayer are involving the air space. So this is what the rabbis say, that yes, even the air space that you're standing is impure. So what to do, Rabbi Nachman says, is transform temporarily the spot where you're davening anywhere in the world, turn it into the Holy Land. Clap your hands in the davening. So that transforms the impurity that you're standing in the diaspora now transforms you back to the Holy Land. So even though you're standing on earth that has remnants 
of idol worshippers inside of it, and it's influencing your body, but still the air of the davening will be transformed by the air that you're generating by clapping your hands, okay? So now, this is the opinion of the rabbis. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, we'll, we'll sign off with this, it's a nice insight. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he's the one who says that this does not, this does not apply to the diaspora, that the air is not impure. And the insight is, it's specifically Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai who said this, because the whole level of holiness of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the Holy Land. The tzaddik, the true tzaddik, which is symbolized for sure, for sure, without a doubt, by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, one of the greatest tzaddikim ever throughout history, one of those few unique souls who represented the holiness of Moshe Rabbeinu himself so completely, Okay, that he is saying, what, what does it mean that the Mishnah says that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai holds that no, the air of the Da'as not impure, it's that condition. It's specifically Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, if your saying is on the level of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, in other words, connected to the holiness of the Holy Land, so therefore at that point, you're not impure. You may be standing in the diaspora, but you're connected to the holiness of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, so it's like you're not in the diaspora and if you remember last week i think we mentioned the opposite you have jews who are actually walking in the holy land but they don't deserve to be here their actions go against the holy land so we said if you remember we quoted a midrash that says that angels come and put earth from the diaspora under the feet of these people so they're actually not walking in the holy land they're actually walking in the diaspora they're not considered to be really in the Holy Land. Physically, to an extent, yes, but spiritually, and for sure their davening is in the air of the diaspora. And when a person, God forbid, is hit with that scenario, that he's physically living in Eretz Israel, he's living in the Holy Land, he's living in Jerusalem, but his actions make him that he's not in the Holy Land, and he wants to do tshuva, to repent, and to come back, to be in the Holy Land, spiritually, not just his feet physically, but that not his body physically, but that he should really like we said, that the, the angels should not put earth of the diaspora under his feet by this person clapping his hands in his davening sincerely and wholeheartedly in order to connect to concentration in the davening. Because another point is, if you have a Jew living in Israel and he cannot concentrate on his davening, it is possibly a clear indication this person is not in the Holy Land right now. If now he's being faced with so many distracting thoughts in his davening, and he lives in Israel, so it's very possible that his actions have made it that he's no longer in the Holy Land. Because the Holy Land is associated with clear thoughts in the davening. So what to do for such a person? It's not like it's over, oh, I don't have the merit, so I'm, I guess I'm doomed. No. To do something to get back into the Holy Land. That my davening should be back in the Holy Land. Clap the hands. Clap the hands. I think we'll stop with this. It's an amazing, intense class. Please get contact me, get back to me if you'd like, by email, mayor e, M E I R E, at breastlove, B R E S L O V dot org. I am having problems to punch it in on the Facebook page. Or I think I can. Let's see if I can do this. M E I R E, at breastlove, B R E S L O V. Org. I hope this gets on the screen. I hope you guys can see that. Okay. And I'll punch that in also on the second page. Okay. Please feel free to get back to me. Uh, I see there's more comments that I did not get to. I'm sorry about that. Just time is out and uh, we have to go for davening. So if you can please email me at this email address, Mayor E. You see it on the screen at breastlove.org. There you go. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining this class. I really hope you get a lot out of it. But, of course, in theory, it's the practice. And I highly suggest, if you want to internalize these teachings, please do yourself a favor and recite Rav Nosim's prayer on this lesson. It's one prayer called Prayers 44 to 46. It's one prayer, including all three lessons. You'll find it in the 50th Gate, Volume 3, the, the green volume that we put out. All right, please, if you do yourself a favor, get into that. All the best, everybody. Thank you for joining. Have a beautiful day.